I call to order the City of Bloomington Board of Zoning Appeals for January the 18th, 2024. Roll call, please. Hey, Ballard. Here. Burrell. Here. Clapper. Here. Throckmorton. Here. Okay. Um, I believe... Wait, other... Oh, Feral. there's one more person. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> Did you say? Yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Nikki, sorry. Okay. Um, we have minutes to approve. I th thought, so we have the November 16th, 2023 minutes. Did we have another set of meeting minutes that were sent out to us? Uh, December's, was December's was sent out as well, right. Um, so let's, has everybody? Sorry. Recording in progress. Thanks, sorry. Okay. Uh, so we have two sets of meeting minutes to approve, the November and December minutes. Uh, any, do I have a motion for either or, or both? I have a motion to approve the November, uh, can I do both? You can. November and December. 2023 uh, minutes. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Are there any changes, corrections, anything? Nope. No. Okay. Um, then could we have a vote, please. Okay. Uh, Burrell? Yes. Clapper? Yes. Um, Throckmorton? Yes. Farrell? Yes. Ballard. Yes. Okay. okay. Do we have any reports, resolutions, and communications? Nope, none tonight. Okay. Thank you. I am filling, I'm Beth Rosenbarger. I'm the assistant director. I'm filling in for Jackie Scanlon tonight. So thank you. Great. Thank you. The petitions uh, that are continued to our February 22nd, 2024 meeting. Uh, we only have one, and that is AA-17-22, Joe Kemp Construction, LLC, and Blackwell Construction, Construction Inc. This evening, we have two petitions on our docket. The first one is V-42-23, Chris Valiant, and the second is V-47-23, Josie Rice. Uh, can we please have uh, the staff report for V-42-23, Chris Valiant? Uh, zoning planner from Planning and Transportation Department. I'm presenting on 346 South Buckner Street, um, V4223. The property in question is located at 346 South Buckner Street in the west central part of Bloomington. Yep. Yes. Is, okay, I wasn't sure. Thank you. This property is located in residential small lot R3 zoning district. It's also located in the Greater Prospect Hill Historic District. All properties immediately adjacent to 346 South Buckner are also in the residential small lot R3 zoning district. This lot has frontage on South Buckner Street to the east and frontage on West Smith Avenue to the south. The comprehensive plans feature land use map designates this property as being located in mixed urban residential, which is an area intended to contain higher densities than other residential areas, including both single family residences and larger two to four story apartment buildings. The property currently contains one existing single family residence, which was relocated here a few years ago. The current 
approved use of the site is dwelling single family detached. Most of the lots in the surrounding neighborhood also contain detached single family dwellings. <clears throat> this is a property, uh, this is a view of the rear of the existing property at 346 South Buckner. As mentioned, this lot has frontage on South Buckner Street to the east and West Smith Avenue to the south. This is a view of West Smith Avenue looking east. And this is a view of South Buckner Street intersecting with West Smith Avenue looking west. Because 346 South Buckner is a corner lot bordered by public streets, South Buckner Street and West Smith Street, both property lines adjacent to these two streets are considered front lot lines. The petitioner is proposing to construct a two-story addition to the existing dwelling on the site. The ground floor of the addition will serve as a garage and the second floor as a general studio space that may become an ADU in the future. The petitioner received a certificate of appropriateness from Historic Preservation Commission in October 2023 for this design. Because the proposed addition is along West Smith Avenue, which is considered a front lot line, front lot setback standards from the UDO apply to the proposed addition. The setback standard for an attached front loading garage or carport is 10 feet behind the primary structure's front building wall. Because the primary structure's south wall along West Smith Avenue is considered a front building wall, the standard in the UDO asks that the proposed attached front loading garage addition be located 10 feet behind the south wall of the primary, existing primary structure. The petitioner is proposing a variance to this setback standard so that he can place the attached garage addition at the same distance back from the property line as the primary structure's um, front building wall along West Smith Avenue or in line with the primary structure's front building wall along West Smith. So the first conclusion is that the granting of variance um, will not be injuri injurious to the public health, safety, or welfare of the community because the proposed addition is compatible with the local neighborhood no uh, other variances are involved. And the petitioner's proposed addition aligns well with both sides of the existing primary structure's building walls, which creates nice symmetry on the lot. The use and value of the area adjacent to the property uh, will not be affected in an adverse manner. West Smith Street is a substandard street averaging around 10 feet in width, used more as an alley for the local properties that all have frontage on, most of which have frontage on other larger streets. The backyards, not the front yards, of neighboring properties are immediately adjacent to West Smith Street across from 346 South Buckner. And placing the proposed attached garage in line with the primary structure's building wall won't affect the use and value, um, nor will it impact potential connections or aesthetics with adjacent neighbors across West Smith. Conclusion three is that the application of the terms of the UDO will re result in practical difficulties because this existing home, uh, the existing home on this property already has a prominent front entrance that faces the larger of the two adjacent street frontages. Although it is a public road, West Smith Avenue doesn't serve as a front for almost any other surrounding lot. West Smith side Avenue of the home functions as a side and rear property line for the, both this property and the majority of the surrounding properties. And all properties in this neighborhood have alternative streets Almost all properties in this neighborhood have, have alternative streets that serve as their street frontage. West Smith Avenue is generally used as an alley for the majority of the local properties. So the department recommends that the Board of Zoning Appeals adopt the proposed findings and approve V4223 
slash VAR 2023-110017 with the following condition, that this approval is for the site design as submitted with this variance application. Thank you very much. Uh, the petitioner, if you'd like to step to the podium and state your name, I will then swear you in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, you have up to 20 minutes to state your petition. Uh, I don't really have much to add. I think the, uh, the um, Katie did a great job of summarizing everything. Uh, I, I had submitted some of my thoughts that were really based on, on what Katie summarized uh, in, in, the, in the planning department's um, um, put, uh, decision to approve as well. Well, thank you. We may have some questions. We'll see what the board um, has to say. So we are to the board for questions. So the petitioner or staff, does anybody have any? Nope. No? Anybody? No? Okay. Then in this case, we will be to the public. Is there anybody here who would like to speak to this petition? This is your opportunity. There may be somebody online. We'll see. If you're on the Zoom call and you would like to comment on this petition, please use the raise hand function to let us know, um, to let us know that you'd like to do that. Thanks. Okay. If there is no one, then we're back to the petitioner for any final comments. I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Okay. Then we're to the board for action. I'm going to go ahead and just cut to the chase and move approval of B-42-23 with the condition as provided in the presentation. Second. Well, two people, there you go. You can take it. <laughs> okay, seconded by Nikki. And any, any further comments before we vote? No? We're ready for a vote, please. Okay, thanks. I'm going to attempt a better alphabetical order this time. Uh, Farrell? Yes. Clapper? Yes. Throckmorton? Yes. Ballard? Yes. Burrell? Yes. Okay, the variance is granted. Good luck with your project. Thank you. Is the petitioner online for the second case? Uh, their name has showed up. Okay. Great. So we are now ready uh, for case V-47-23, Josie Rice. Staff report when you are ready. My name is Gabriel Holbrow, zoning planner for the city of Bloomington, here to present uh, the variance petition for 1205 West East Branch Road, V-47-23, also numbered VAR 2023-12-0021. Uh, the location, 1205 West East Branch Road, is on the west side of the city um, in a residential neighborhood just north of Allen... Allen Street, Allen Drive. Um, it's toward the end of a cul-de-sac. It's a relatively short street that ends in a cul-de-sac. The property is approximately a little over 8,000 square feet. It's zoned residential small lot R3. In the comprehensive plan, it's designated neighborhood residential. The existing and proposed land use is a uh, single family detached dwelling. The short version of the story, uh, it's more detailed in the staff report and in the petitioner's statement. Short version of the story is that there was a grass part of the yard where the uh, street bends into the cul-de-sac and uh, it was the petitioner converted it to a parking area by putting down some gravel. Um, it does not meet the standards for a parking area because it is, uh, the width is more than what's allowed. So the existing concrete drive that you can see there in the 2013 street view is approximately 16 feet wide. Uh, 
the maximum driveway width in this district is 18 feet. Uh, it was by expanding between the existing driveway and the cul-de-sac, uh, it's approximately 26 feet in that same dimension. But if, uh, if you consider anywhere where the parking area meets the public right-of-way, it's uh, so wrapping around the cul-de-sac would be 60 feet wide. And in any case, we're, we're talking about the same parking area. Um, to uh, skip over some of the details, the petitioner and the staff report are in agreement about particular uh, peculiar things regarding this property uh, that include there's a narrow roadway width adjacent to the property, an unusual property shape, um, documented drainage issues, documented uh, parking difficulties. So the staff report uh, shares with the petitioner's statement uh, findings that these are things that are a little bit unusual about the property. Where we differ is when it comes to whether there are practical difficulty in use of the property. Staffs, uh, the petitioner, by bringing the petition, is, is um, stating that, that there is a hardship that they're experiencing. That's why request, they're requesting the variance. And staff's analysis is that um, it is not a practical difficulty because the UDO compliant parking area does provide room, or a UDO compliant parking area provides room for uh, two vehicles parked outside. And as well, there's a, a, an attached garage structure that could, at least in theory, have a parking um, it provide a, a parking space as well, and there are uh, there is parking on street parking nearby, even if it's not directly in front of the property. So uh, the the crux of the question really is whether there is a practical difficulty. I think that's the main point where staff and the petitioner uh, differ. Um, to go over the staff, so staff is recommending denial. Uh, staff's proposed findings for you are uh, for the first criterion that it, the approval will not be injurious to public health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the community. Staff recommends that no, it will not be injurious to public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, second criterion that the use and value of the area adjacent to the property will not be affected in a substantially adverse manner. Um, staff's recommended uh, finding is that it will result in adverse impacts to the use and value of surrounding properties by reducing the aesthetic quality of the subject property's frontage when viewed from the public street from neighboring properties. Additionally, the fact that uh, we received complaint indicates that it's already caused issues for surrounding properties. And finally, the third proposed finding, this is uh, the criterion is that the strict application of the terms of the UDO will result in practical difficulties in the use of the property, that the practical difficulties are peculiar to the property, and that the development standards that variance will relieve the practical difficulties. The proposed finding is that the narrow roadway width adjacent to the property, the unusual property shape at the elbow where the linear portion of East Branch Road meets the circular cul-de-sac at its end, and the documented drainage issues are all features of the property and its surroundings that are peculiar. These peculiar features reduce the area that can be used for UDO compliant parking area compared to other properties of similar size. However, no practical difficulty is found because a UDO compliant parking area has in the past provided room to park two vehicles outside as well as one or more vehicles in the attached garage. Because the UDO does not have any minimum parking requirements for detached single family dwellings, parking for three or more vehicles at the property is consistent with the expectations for this use. Additionally, as in many other areas of the city, parking immediately adjacent to the property in the public right-of-way is not guaranteed, and a review of aerial imagery shows that vehicles are parked in the right-of-way further west on this block. Based on uh, the proposed findings and the record, the do department recommends that the board adopt the proposed findings and deny the requested variance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If the petitioner is online, you can pull her up. Hi, I'm not sure if you can hear me. We can hear you. Uh, hi, my name is Josie. Hi, Josie, do you swear to, can you state your full name, please? Josie Rice. 
Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I okay. do. Okay. You have up to 20 minutes to uh, comment on your petition. Thanks. Okay. So um, I just wanted to do a little bit of background of how the petition came into um, fruition, really, uh, especially after hearing that it was because of complaints. Um, I'm sorry. I'm um, so we had our car parked in halfway on the grass and halfway into the cul-de-sac and we had received a ticket from the city stating that we needed to um, put the car on a approved surface. And that is when we went and put the gravel down, which was a major financial burden on our family. Um, we put the gravel down hoping to bring our property up to code. Um, there were neighboring properties that surround us in our cul-de-sac that also had their car parked on the cul-de-sac and it became an issue for the city drivers who were driving to pick up trash to get around our cul-de-sac. So we ended up moving our cars out of the cul-de-sac into our property. Um, and that also allows access for our daughter who's 22 and she has Williams syndrome to have an accessible parking spot um, to help with her disability. So she gets picked up by the Bloomington Access Bus directly at our location too. So there is limited um, parking in front of our building as well. Our neighbors that are across the street from us, they park in, in their spot right in front of our house and um, our house has a major drainage issues like was in the petition. Um, so we are unable to park in that front area at all to be able to have an accessible spot for her and without it damaging our yard. And I also have put in um, to try to meet the city standards, put in a rain garden that I have tried to apply for the um, stormwater grant for as well. So I'm trying to correct these issues on our property, uh, but we've been kind of put in between a rock and a hard place to make it both accessible and then able for the city vehicles to turn around in our cul-de-sac and um, for our neighbors to continue to have their parking spots as well. So if the parking area that we currently use is removed from us and revegetated. Um, not only will it cause a major financial strain on our family, who is right now in a burden situation, um, and then it would also cause those spots that our neighbors um, park in to be taken, and that would cause some strife in the neighborhood too. I've had multiple of our neighbors call me and um, state that that they would prefer us to have that location um, as a gravel parking space for our family so that we would stay and that would open up some more space for them. Um, so that is a quick summary, not to um, get too into the, into the dirt with that, but I am definitely open for any questions. This has been something that would um, have an impact on our family. I think it might be helpful for me to understand a practical, the definition of a practical, um, the practical difficulties. And if you guys have any questions, um, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are to the board for questions. Anybody have any questions? Like this? Could you turn your it mic on? on? Are you on? Sorry. How long have you owned the home? Yeah, thank you. So we are actually on a contract sale with Jeff Jones, who owns the Pendragon Properties. Um, we are really trying to take care of this home and keep it nice and not have any difficulties with him because I know that many of the other properties that he has has liens on them. So that's another reason why I would really like to um, protect our property and keep it looking nice for our family and our neighbors. Um, we've been here for 
five, well, since 2018 is when we moved into this home. I have a question for staff. So uh, there were a couple of issues uh, relating, so there's the, the width of the driveway, and then there's the issue of the apron. How, how far back does an apron typically extend? Is there a standard depth? There's not. Uh, so uh, different from this situation, if it were new construction, like completely new site, generally the expectation that would be that the apron would be completely within the right of way. Um, and for, for existing sites like this, uh, it's really uh, sort of a, a more of an engineering design question um, that often we will consult with the engineering department about. Here, uh, there are different reasons to, to have an apron. Um, the main one that would come into play for this situation would be to contain the gravel so it doesn't spill out into the street. So as long as there were um, some uh, either concrete or asphalt uh, transition from the gravel to the street in a way that would help prevent gravel from spilling out. Of course, gravel still might spill out. That, that, that can happen. Um, but to, to help try to contain it, that, that, would, meet the, that would meet the standard. Um, so as far as how, how wide it would have to be, um, I couldn't say right away tonight, but um, a few feet would be would be plenty. So the, the width of a driveway, um, people can have pull-offs for parking off of their driveway, can they not? Right? That's just a is that just uh, controlled by impervious surface? Stop. So, so uh, the driveway width standard applies from the front property line, the edge of right-of-way, up to the building setback line. And once you get past that, uh, then it can widen out and uh, you're simply, uh, you simply just have to not go over the impervious surface coverage. And in some cases, uh, in, in other districts, not this district, there's also a, a parking setback from site property lines, but not in this district anyway. Um, but, but the width of the driveway can't widen out until you get to that building setback line. For most properties, the building is at the building setback line or at or near, so really it, it only can widen out once it gets past the building. As you can see where the house is situated on this lot, there's not really a way to, to snake around unless you completely redesign everything about the site. Um, while I have the microphone, I just do want to mention that uh, we had received one call from a neighbor um, who was not able to t attend tonight, uh, simply expressing their support for the variance. Thank you. Any other questions? I just want to be clear. So the, this to staff, uh, currently the actual poured driveway is 16 feet wide, according to this, right? So what's what's allowed? Just the 16 feet was was. 18 feet is a lot, so it could be it could be widened by an, another two feet and be fully compliant. Thank you. I'll go I'll go further to to just clarify. So one of the arguments being made here is because of the cul-de-sac coming around, you could really say that there's 60 feet of of actual coverage on the public roadway. Is, is that the is that am I reading that correctly? Yeah, I mean, it depends on, on for what purpose you're asking the question. How wide is it? If you're asking for the purpose of you know I'm I'm uh, implementing the law and I don't care about common sense. I just care about exactly what the law says, I would say the answer is 60 feet. If you're thinking about it common sense wise, what is the impact, it's more like 26 feet. Could they uh, t take out the current gravel, take it off the board? So they have the 16 foot. If they came from the cul-de-sac side, and, and would they be allowed to put another uh, drive off there onto their property or not? What, what's allowed? I'm sorry? 
constant? Well, I'm just well, saying, what's, what's allowed for them okay. to do? Would they even be allowed to do that? Um, do you follow what I'm saying? In theory, in theory, yes. I mean, it depends on exactly the design and, and so on. But in theory, uh, so you could work certainly. with them to, to try to find a way to eliminate that that patch of, of of gravel that's essentially 60 feet wide leave the existing driveway and then find a way to pull off from the cul-de-sac. Yeah, although as a, as a practical, oh. Yeah, right, but they would have to remove the existing drive that, cut. That's my question, thank yeah, you. So you'd have to remove the existing drive cut. So you, you might be able to, to shift it 90 degrees, but you wouldn't get any more width or yeah. length. So that was my it question. wouldn't really get them anything. Yeah. The question is whether there could be two. In no, there cannot be two. That's thank all. you for, for yeah. clarifying that. Thank you. Nikki, did you, did you have another question? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Throckmorton asked basically the same thing, so. Okay. Um, this is for staff. How is, how is the parking on East Branch Road? I see that there is a vacant lot across the street. Is, is it parking on one side of the road or two side of the road or, or none? So uh, parking restrictions, uh, are codified in municipal code in Title 15. If you look in Title 15, East Branch Road is not mentioned, meaning that parking on both sides of the street is not forbidden. The citations for the access for sanitation, essentially. So that happens one day a week. So essentially not parking there for that one day, they could avoid any ticketing, right? They would not be ticketed the rest of the time, would they? They're being ticketed because they're obstructing sanitation. So the, the exact reason for the tickets is not firmly established in the record. Uh, I guess I'll say, I, at least, um, I'm, I'm not sure how many tickets there have been. At least one of them was for parking on unimproved surface, which is a little bit of a different well, issue. I you specifically called out difficulty with the sanitation. Um, yes, uh, that I may have to amend a little bit of my wording. The wording in the staff report is city parking enforcement has issued tickets to vehicles parked in the public right of way of East Branch Road based at least partly on the obstruction the parked vehicles caused for city sanitation trucks serving the homes on the street. I have to amend that and say, City Parking Enforcement has issued tickets to vehicles parked in the public right of, public right of way of each branch, East Branch Road, period. There have been complaints about obstruction, uh, uh, that parked vehicles obstructed city sanitation trucks from serving homes on the street. I actually have not been able to verify that that was what caused the tickets. But uh, it is clear from the petitioner's statement that there have been complaints and instructions from city sanitation not to park on the cul-de-sac. I guess what I'm getting at is if they were asked to remove the gravel area, uh, the, the question becomes where, if anywhere, could they park on the, on the cul-de-sac legally? So um, without getting ticketed, it, since it's a public street. This is getting a little bit outside of my knowledge into the parking enforcement's rules and standards. Um, my understanding, my understanding is that it would be legal to park anywhere on the cul-de-sac. That said, it's probably a bad idea to park in the cul-de-sac, even if it's legal. Well, that's, th those are two different things. The question is, yes. can they legally park there and yeah, I don't, reasonably expect not to be ticketed because it's legal? I'm uncomfortable, uh, I'm uncomfortable stating what park, parking enforcement would or wouldn't do, but to staff's knowledge, it would be legal to park. It would, it would not be illegal to park on the cul-de-sac. Yeah, whether it's a good idea or not, a good, that's another discussion. But. You know, for the purpose of trying to determine what to do in this case, I, I'm just trying to understand if they have an option to, to street park. Possibly down the street, not on the cul-de-sac. Not on the cul-de-sac, but down the street. It seems like it would be more advisable. Well, yeah. again, the difference between advisable because the, 
what you'll run into then is a legal issue is, legally am I allowed? That's why I'm asking if they're, if it's what the legality is. I don't know. I, I think that the staff report also kind of says that it's somewhat irrelevant, the street parking, because there are plenty of places in town where you can't park on the street. And the co right, in terms right. of, you know, your, your, your parking allowance um, is the same across all of the zoning, you know, the residential zoning districts, regardless of what the street condition is. That, that's a good right? summary of stats analysis, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in Title 15, which is not the UDO, but uh, relevant to the question of where you can park, you can park on that street. I think, I will just say as staff, I'm happy for us to follow up. If there's a section of street that's a repeatedly an issue with the streets department, it would make sense for us to identify that and put signs out so that's clear to people. So if regularly people can't actually park on the cul-de-sac, we would rather have a clear regulation about that. Um, the code also says you have to maintain 12 feet of clear space on the street. So what we see in a lot of neighborhoods and small streets is that people do uh, a great job of that, of self-regulating in terms of even though you can park on both sides of the street, they are, uh, surprisingly logical and you know alternate or space out and do different things like that so that a vehicle could still get through so just to clarify how some of that works thanks the story of the question really was just to determine whether it was going to turn into a legal question or not so that was that was why i asked thank you ms ms rice um can you talk a little bit about the stormwater issue and where exactly on the property is do you have do you have that? Because um, I wasn't clear exactly where on the property that that issue is. Yes, thank you. So the stormwater issue starts from the um, the top of West East Branch Street, and it pours down on our side of the road, and it all floods and lands into our front yard. We have kind of a dip there, um, so it is it flows from our front yard and floods the front yard and then kind of goes directly across the street into the lot that is right across from us. Um, sometimes it looks like a little raging river. So I have tried to kind of regulate that as well, um, but I'm not having, I think that's more of a long-term problem that we will try to work on. Yard, that's in front of the the entry to the house sort of um sure so like where other neighbors in our location seem to park is they park half of their car in their grass and half on the street which opens up the street for the city vehicles and other vehicles to get through um, and when we have our flooding it is completely unable for us to pull on so we would take up the whole road which would block our neighbor's um, driveway there and i do hear um, a lot of the down the street parking which i understand because i was a college student at iu i've lived here and i stayed here so i'm grateful to be here so i would park way far away um, back in the day and walk to my housing um, but again with our daughter it, it just creates a, a difficulty for us practically for her to um, be able to get to our vehicles because of her mobility issues. I have a question for Josie. Um, from the map from what I'm looking at the aerial map it looks like you were uh, parking about four cars there every day, is that correct? So we have three vehicles that we use daily. Have you considered the possibility of moving one into the garage and then having two behind it and then taking the, the fourth vehicle to a, to a location up the street? Um, that so our garage is currently not inhabitable for a vehicle, but yes, I do understand that that would be the most ideal of the situation. Great, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? No? Okay. Then we are to the public. If there's anybody here who would like to speak to this, we are to the public. If there's anybody here who would like to speak to this petition, now is the opportunity. There's no one in chambers. And if you're on, um, participating on Zoom and would like to comment, please use the raise hand function. Nobody? Okay. Then we are back to the petitioner for any further, um, any further comments. Um, yeah, I, I do I recognize this is a very um, logically driven group and that emotional appeals probably don't have much weight, um, but I would like to give my two cents if possible. I've tried to manage this on my own um, and just trying to make everybody happy, starting with the city vehicles and with neighbors and with the rain garden. So we're really trying to make steps um, to show the city that we do care for our property and we want to take care of it in the best way that we can. Um, I feel that if this is not approved, then it will fall into probably the hands of Jeff Jones. I'm not sure if you guys have better communication with him than I do, but um, I know there are multiple properties with Pendragon properties that have liens on them. I would hate to see this property fall into um, that sort of cycle that I've watched other neighboring houses in our neighborhood fall into. Um, so I just kind of want to put my heart out there and tell you that I'm really trying to take care of our property and our home and that this would be a great blessing to our family if it was approved. And that is it. And I thank you guys for your time too. Thank you. Okay, then we are back to uh, the board for any further questions or um, discussion. Um, and or uh, eventually we need a motion. I guess I'll, I would just ask this to, to the rest of you, in terms of uh, what Ms. Rice just explained, would that fun fall under uh, being deemed a practical difficulty, which is this could get into a much more complex situation for them, given the structure of how they are trying to buy the home if it goes into a lean situation that way. I mean, that, that to me, I think, plays a factor. And what I'm trying to think through here of how to come to a decision, but. So I, I think we would need some um, legal guidance. Um, and I know that Ms. Um, Ms. Rice asked earlier about how a practical difficulty is defined. And um, usually that is, or what we understand is that it is something, um, a practical difficulty is something that's tied to um, a unique uh, characteristic of, of the property um, physically. Uh, the way it's situated, its context, um, uh, it's, um, you know, the shape, um, you, ha you can name it, but it, it, it sort of rests in the physical the physical aspect, and um, we do not take into account other other considerations, um, unless if you could if you could perhaps sure, just, give us just some. To be clear, so when we're talking about practical difficulties under the law, it's not a limited set of circumstances. It is actually very circumstantially driven, which is kind of what you're alluding to here in terms of the property. Uh, there are three factors, though, that the court system has uh, encouraged boards to look at and just to, to list those really quickly. Uh, one of those is whether there will be some significant economic injury that will result in the enforcement of the ordinance. Uh, whether that injury, though, is self-created is a second factor. And then the third factor are whether there are feasible alternatives. So when we're talking about the physical nature of this property, that's probably where you get into the, the are there feasible alternatives and how much economic injury may, might be suffered here or whether it was self-created by 
for instance, you know, not to apply too strictly to the facts of, you know, how many cars are being parked, whether there's unimproved surfaces and things like that. So it is a, it's an open list of factors, just to be clear though, and you can consider any of the factors that you've heard tonight just to, in that, in that particular element of practical difficulties. Does that help? Yeah, that, that helps, thank you. Okay. I have a question for staff. Um, the, the reason that we limit the size or the width of driveways, um, can you talk a little bit about that? And, uh, you know, sort of why our ordinance is written the way it is? Uh, I will try, try to give some answers to that, and if, if uh, Beth Rosenbarger wants to uh, add some more, I'll ask her too, but uh, I think there's, uh, one of the reasons is uh, essentially aesthetic, um, that, uh, or, or aesthetics that ties into to other things about um, creating a sense of community. So, so uh, there's there's the way that cars look when all you all you see from the street is just all these parked cars, and some might uh, I think one of the things that's behind the limit on the width is that that is simply visually unattractive. There's also something to say about um, that that shows a community of vehicles, not a community of people. Um, and so there's part of it's about uh, making space for the building to be visible, the windows to be visible, a porch or a front entry to be visible, to, to make it more of a community of, of people um, and people, places for people as opposed to places for vehicles. Um, then there's also uh, related to that, uh, but there, it's a way of um, indirectly limiting how much parking can be on a site, which is uh, indirectly also uh, make just small incentives toward uh, making it more possible to not be dependent on motor vehicles and particularly um, the internal combustion putting out carbon pollution. Um, that's more of a, it's, 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 a li it's a few steps away, but that's there in the regulation. It's, it, it's there in the goals as well. Um, if you think there's anything that should be added to that. Um, everything Gabriel said. And uh, a big part of driveway widths is pedestrian safety usually. So it's actually most of the time people pull into driveways and then they're backing out onto the street. Uh, you could always back into your driveway. But if there's, in this case, there's not a sidewalk on that side of the street. So people are, if they're walking, going to be in the street. If there is sidewalk, usually driveways are over sidewalks. And um, we want to limit the amount of times there are vehicles crossing a sidewalk. So in other areas, or in some zoning districts in the city, as you all are familiar, if there's an alley present, that's why we require alley usage for uh, driveways and garages in order to reduce the amount of, or the instances of cars driving over the sidewalk. So that safety element is one portion too. Thanks. And if we were to allow the gravel to remain, it would still need to be retained and defined with a, with a an edging or be, because there is no infrastructure along the street there's that, there's no that would be a requirement yes uh, I would recommend that if the board is interested in uh, making findings to grant approval I would recommend a condition just stating explicitly that those uh, sections of of code that is requiring an apron and requiring a raised border to contain the gravel, that those just, uh, I would recommend a condition to just explicitly state that those apply. Ms. Rice, I have a question for you. Um, you said you're under contract. So is this a conditional sales contract? Are you renting to own? 
Yes, so <laughs> that is a really great question. Um, so we were in a pretty vulnerable situation five years ago. I'm a stepmom to eight kids. We have four young boys living in the house with us. And um, at the time, I found this home in a lovely neighborhood and signed a conditional contract. It was a one-year contract sale with Jeff Jones um, with the condition that we could refinance with a mortgage in one year. Uh, that one year came around and whenever we went to refinance, um, the kind of can of worms opened up that he has so many liens on his properties that we were not legally able to refinance with a bank. So we were kind of uh, manipulated into this situation and um, we're under the understanding that we would be on a mortgage at this point. So five, six years later, we are still on contract and paying to the bank of Jeff Jones. Um, but overall, we have kept the relationship on good terms because um, we love our property and we are not planning on leaving at any time soon. Thank you. Rent to own. Thank you. Yeah. So she, sure. she does not own the property. Okay. Any any discussion? Does anybody want to? I mean. I'm not really sure what to do with this. I, 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 you know, I could easily see how a um, a cider, I can call it, to the existing driveway near the garage would work, so that you could have side by side parking. It, it's, I, I believe, based on what you said earlier, it's be, it's not beyond the the line that there's the setback line, but that I could vary to say, well, go ahead and put it in, because then you're not parking the car right up against the, the cul-de-sac line. Right. So that, you know, for me, I, I can see that there are ways to get somewhere to alleviate the, the issue. Um, you know, there's some jockeying that would have to take place uh, to address uh, the daughter, you know, making sure that the car can pull in, you know, instead of being down the street. Those are things that can be handled personally. Right. But in terms of a realistic, addition to this house that would, would probably, because of the location at the cul-de-sac, not have those issues of pedestrians, there's no sidewalk there, et cetera. So I could see that being reasonable without encroaching on the cul-de-sac, but I mean, I don't know whether that does anything for us, but I could see that that could be a, a variance that if, that if that came in saying, here's the plan I want, I wanna do that, that's something I could do. I'm not really comfortable with just saying, you know, just leave the gravel there, cover it, and you know, because it just doesn't seem like a, a good way to go down that road. But I think there's other ways to to get some to to alleviate some of the issues here. Right. And at this point, the variance that's being requested is for um, it's it's specific. Well, it says a variance from driveway pavement with standards to allow a parking area in the front yard that exceeds 18 feet. So that's the actual variance that we would be granted, or will we, are we tied to a certain number? Was there a request? Uh, I'd like Mr. Allen to, to chime in, but uh, my understanding is that um, the, within their, their request is, has set the scope of what they're asking for. They're asking for relief from that part of code. And they're asking for everything that's there now to be allowed. If the board finds that there are reasons to grant some relief, but puts conditions on it that's not everything that they ask for, I believe that's well within your scope of, of what's the request and what, what you can do. Because that's a pretty broad <laughs> you know, they could they could put more if you if we approve this because it's not specific. I I would also recommend if you're considering approval to 
put some sort of limits on what's approved. For example, you could have a condition saying something like only the existing uh, expanded driveway as shown in the petition materials is approved. No further expansion is allowed. You could have a condition like that. You could have a condition that limits it more if you find reasons in your findings to, to, to have such a condition. Yeah, I was supporting Varian that that's a, that's a pretty wide variance to just grant as written. Right. So right. absolutely there would have right. to be. Yeah. Did you have something to add, Mr. Allen? I just, I just yeah, reasonable conditions can be placed on it under Section 918.5, which is the Board of Zoning Appeals statute. Okay, because sometimes the way the sometimes the way the request is written kind of locks yeah. us into just granting that or not granting that, but not the case here. That's correct. Okay. They can park on the lot across the street, regardless of the ownership of that lot. I think that would be completely out of bounds um, because that's outside of the request. It's granting relief that has nothing to do with the condition, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so I think there are things that could be out of your bounds, but I think conditions on the shape of the driveway uh, are totally within, within reasonable, reasonable conditions on, on what you're looking at. So do we want to um, think about a crafting? I do have one question, and I think mm -hmm. the, the board may know this. What's the, what would be the standard width of a two-car side-by-side driveway? Well, 18 feet is the... 18 feet, 18 feet would handle two cars? Feet. I'm sorry? Yeah. yeah. It's missing two feet. Yeah, so if it had an, an extra two an feet, extra it would be a... Feet, you could park two cars side-by-side, possibly. Yeah, it wouldn't line up obviously with the garage, but it would it would be wide enough for two cars to park. So you could theoretically have four cars in there theoretically. Correct. There are other homes in the neighborhood that have two car driveways, and if you look back at the picture from 2013, this has been it looks like an issue since 2013. People have been parking on this. Yeah. Grassy, oh yeah, I see that. Knoll, so. But but in in order for the purpose of you know finding some relief, you know, it, um, I, I would, you know, that would be something I could support if we a approved a, a variance that allowed for an additional two feet on the existing driveway, and then that should alleviate the problem. They can do that by right. They, okay, so we don't even have to approve it. Right. But this to me, so I'm a little confused because it looks like a, is it an eight foot, nine foot garage door? I mean, I just, I, it just does not look to be as wide as 16 feet. <laughs> we have a table here. Uh, I think I, I actually do not recall where this 16 foot came from, uh, and it was it was definitely not because I went out there and measured, measured it. it. Okay. So that 16 foot is uh, strongly approximate. Okay. It could be well under 16 feet currently. Um, I, I think I would strongly discourage you from having any kind of condition so many feet more than the existing driveway since we're not sure exactly how wide that is. Right. I think it would be much safer to simply say what the allowed width would be. Right. Okay. I didn't realize until I was told though that it, so it could be done by right. If, if they're allowed, if this house is allowed an 18 foot wide drive, then they can do that without any variance at all is what I'm hearing. Is that correct? Right. And it, my estimation is that's 10 to 12 feet wide right It now. doesn't look 16 at all. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that would be the issue. You know, if you denied the variance, you would just say you have every right to ex expand that so long as, as both the owner, current owner, and the, the current petitioner understand that they could simply, ex they could simply expand it. But it would have to be, what type of surface would it have to be? Could it be gravel as well? Uh, so, as long as it's contained within a raised border. So they could and contain it, so they could take the materials they've already purchased, move it into a different position, and, and be well within their rights. So long as it's contained to not exceed the 16 feet. Yes, and we have to have an extended apron as well. Extended apron. Yeah, yeah, I understood. Yeah. I understood, okay. Thank you. Um, well, we can ask Ms. Rice what she thinks of that. So um, what we're discussing right now, Ms. Rice, is that it looks like you only really have a driveway that's like 10 to 12 feet wide. And, and so 
you know, legally you can have up to 18 feet in width, which is designed to allow two car, two vehicles to park next to each other. And then um, depending on the length of the driveway, and it sounds, it looks like you have enough length, then you could have vehicles parked behind that, those two cars as well. So um, what, we're, what we're discussing is that it might be possible to kind of um, rake the gravel over so that it is just adjacent to the existing parking so that that gravel area and the existing um, driveway in total is 18 feet wide and then would allow you to park those three or four cars that you're needing to park there. Does that does that make sense? Um, yes, that makes sense. I think that um, I think I'm still a little bit curious about what the like retaining option with edging would be. Um, but it, like like you all discussed, I am definitely open to um, your advice with this. My whole process has been to try to get our home nice, and and I want to do that in the best way possible. Um, if that is the grace that we're offered, um, I still think that it would be a financial difficulty for us, but we can try to... Um, figured that out. I've, I've done measuring and to like, whenever I was doing it, it seemed that the 18 feet was, a, it was only extending it just a tiny bit. That's why, where this all came from is we were just kind of shocked that that's as far as we could extend it. So, um, so do you know that was just kind of the process that we went through when we were measuring. So what is the width then? If you've measured the driveway, what is the width of the driveway? I believe it was 16 feet because it was only adding on two. Um, I, I, I believe that's what the report said as well. That's my understanding of it. Okay. The, the width. Um, I, uh, I'm looking and my recollection is that I got the, in the staff report, I got the 16 feet directly from the petitioner's statement. Um, I'm looking at aerial imagery now and like most driveways, there's the width that it is on the property, and then um, once it gets into the right of way, it flares out to allow turnings. Um, that's usually where the apron is. Uh, so I'm measuring on aerial imagery. This is not exact at all, but it appears that where it flares out and meets the uh, existing pavement of the street, it's approximately 16 feet. But that's within, it appears to be within the right of way and it narrows, it, it narrows it, um, as you come from the street into the property, it narrows, and actually on the property, it appears to be 12 feet. Um, so it may have been that Ms. Rice was measuring right at the uh, edge of pavement where it ap does appear to be 16 feet, but it narrows down. So once it's on, uh, on the property, it, ap it appears closer to 12 feet, which would match what you were estimating based on the garage door size. For me, the, the direction that we take revolves around this. It sounds like we can deny this because both the homeowner and the current person, uh, people renting, the petitioner, have the ability to solve this problem by expanding their, their driveway to what's allowed. So if that's the case, that seems to be the simplest, best way to approach it and right now from what I'm hearing. And I'd love to hear other opinions. With that, um, I think in conjunction with them working with city staff in terms of making sure if this is denied, they still know how wide they can go and getting the barrier in place that's necessary, like you guys would continue to work with them to make sure that was done in compliance. Yeah. I, I think the biggest issue maybe for the petitioner might be if you own property, let's say in the county that doesn't have these strict width, you, you have the advantage of more space. And I think it's more difficult sometimes to think I'm living in the city with some restrictions. And even though it's 18 feet by code, they may feel that's tight, but that's still what other people are getting. And that's 
that is a, a, a coded issue, right? So I think that sometimes is the misconnect. So I'd really like to have a little more space and it's easier to spread. Um, but for me, that's not a big enough argument to, to, to go away from letting them use what they're allowed to first before granting a variance. I'm inclined to agree. I think that there are feasible alternatives available, um, like utilizing the garage and, and moving vehicles around, and I think that there are some other ways that this can be overcome. Right. Our hope, I think our hope is that you could just reuse the material that's there and just maybe reconfigure it a little bit, add the appropriate edging with guidance, and, um, and that will kind of bring you into a compliance situation and allow you to use the property as you need to. So uh, we're still back to the board, right? So we can make a motion. I mean, I would make a motion that therefore to deny B-47-23 with the caveat uh, additional statement of because uh, this is an issue that could be handled within code to still provide the petitioner the relief they need. Okay, then we're ready for a vote. Clapper? Yes. Throckmorton? Yes. Ballard? Yes. Burrell? Yes. Farrell? Yes. Okay, so the variance is denied, but you will be able to work with planning to, to sort out the configuration uh, so that it is co-compliant and um, can meet your needs. Okay? Okay, thanks so much. Okay, and we are adjourned.